Okay, I think we should start. So I'm glad that um, Professor Eric Maskey is continuing his second lecture. And I think it's been exciting, uh, the first lecture. And I'm glad that many people are coming again. And Sake is going to chair this uh, lecture. Sake. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, just uh, uh, some logistics. Professor Maskin will answer the questions at the end of the talk. Uh, unless they are concerned with some clarification of what he already said and are required in order to follow the lecture. Uh, please post your questions in the Q&A space. Uh, we also keep the chat open. So if you have uh, something to ask uh, of clarification nature, and uh, then please ask there. And either Professor Maskin will, will answer if too many people are stuck at the same point or maybe even some other participants will help because that's the way it worked on Monday and it worked pretty well. Thank you, Professor. Well, hello again, everyone. Um, before I start the second lecture, I just want to take up a couple of uh, questions, very good questions that were raised uh, about the first lecture. Uh, various people asked, uh, what about uniqueness of Nash equilibrium? I showed you Nash's theorem, which establishes that there exists at least one equilibria. Can we say when there will exist only one equilibrium? Uh, of course, uh, not in general. A and I showed you uh, uh, this game, which is uh, on the slide last time where there are, uh, there are uh, two pure strategy equilibria. BB is, a, is, a, is an equilibrium, FF is an equilibrium. There's also a mixed strategy equilibrium. Uh, so we need, uh, in general, rather strong conditions to obtain uniqueness, to avoid uh, this sort of situation. Uh, but uh, as, uh, as I will say in a, in a couple of minutes, uh, there's a there's an important class of games, uh, two player zero sum games, where uh, we may not have literal uniqueness, but we have essential uniqueness, and I'll explain that. Okay, another question had to do with uh, finding uh, a Nash equilibrium uh, as the limits of Nash equilibria uh, in finite approximations. Remember when I showed you that a Nash equilibrium exists in a continuous game, I did that by looking, applying Nash's theorem to approximations, taking the limit. And the question is, does this sequence, does this sequence of equilibrium approximation games converge? Uh, well, actually it may not converge, but if it doesn't converge, then uh, we just take a convergent subsequence, which will which will always exist. So every every sequence has a convergent subsequence. And then uh, someone asked, uh, does there exist a uh, a Nash equilibrium in chess? Uh, and uh, a chess is actually a uh, a finite game, uh, at least uh, in in tournament play. There are so-called termination rules, which guarantee that the game can't go on forever. Uh, so uh, if we apply those termination rules, uh, chess is finite and therefore we can play, we can apply Nash's theorem. Uh, so yes, a uh, Nash equilibrium does exist, but as I'll say again in a minute, uh, there's a very uh, strong kind of equilibrium uh, in chess, uh, given by the minimax theorem, which we which we talked about briefly last time. Let let me remind you uh, of the minimax theorem. Uh, due to von Neumann, uh, if we're looking at a two-player zero-sum game, zero-sum means that the payoffs add up to zero. So if I win, that means you lose, and vice versa. Uh, there will exist uh, a pair of strategies, uh, one for each player, uh, which satisfy, first of all, 
uh, this pair of inequalities, which is called the saddle, the saddle point property. Uh, it, if I'm player I, if I deviate from my equilibrium strategy, my payoff goes down. That's just the Nash equilibrium property. But if U deviates, uh, my payoff goes up. Uh, and that follows from the zero sum property. Uh, furthermore, uh, if, I, if I do play my, uh, my minimax equilibrium strategy, I'm guaranteeing that my worst possible payoff is maximized. Uh, and then finally, uh, suppose there are multiple uh, minimax uh, equilibria. So P1 star, P2 star is an equilibrium, but also P1 double star, P2 double star. Uh, well then, um, it's okay if I use my minimax equilibrium strategy for the start equilibrium, and you use your minimax equilibrium strategy for the double starred equilibrium. If we put those together, uh, that will form an equilibrium too. In other words, I don't have to know which of the multiple uh, minimax equilibrium strategies you're using. Uh, and you don't have to know which one I'm using. Uh, whichever ones we use, they will form an equilibrium uh, and they will all give the same payoff. So that's the sense in which in a two person zero sum game, there can be multiple equilibria, but they always give the same payoff. There is essential uniqueness. Uh, now, uh, what, what about chess? Uh, now chess is, is not only a two person zero sum game, it's a game of perfect information. And we saw from Zermelo's theorem last time that in a game of perfect equilibrium, of uh, a, a, a perfect information, uh, there exists a pure strategy equilibrium. That is an equilibrium without randomization. Uh, so what can we say on the basis of the Minimax theorem about chess? Well, first, uh, Either it's the case that both sides can guarantee at least a draw. So I might have a strategy which regardless of what you do will give me at least a draw or one side can guarantee a win. Now we don't know uh, which of these two holds for chess, interestingly. We, we, we know that one of them must hold, but we don't know which one holds because the because Nash's theorem and von Neumann's theorem are non-constructive. They don't actually give us the equilibrium strategies. That they just tell us that they exist. Um, and furthermore, we know from Zermelo's theorem that the, that the optimal strategies don't involve any randomizing. So uh, it, it's remarkable how much we can say about a game like chess without actually knowing what the equilibrium strategies are, the optimal strategies. Okay, let, let me turn to the subject matter uh, of today's lecture, uh, which is uh, mechanism design. So uh, let's, let's start with a, a little example. Uh, let's imagine uh, that there's a town uh, that wants to uh, move over to green energy. They, they want to stop uh, emitting carbon dioxide. And they have to decide what energy source to use. Uh, there are four possibilities. They could use solar energy, they could use wind energy, they could use nuclear, or they could use uh, hydroelectric power. Uh, and let's imagine that the leadership of the town, the mayor wants to use uh, the energy type that the citizens want. Uh, and to make matters simple, we'll suppose that they're just three citizens, it's a, it's a small town. There are three citizens, uh, Alice, Bob, and Cal. Um, and uh, let's suppose that uh, the mayor doesn't know what Alice, Bob, and Cal wants. Uh, to make matters simple, we'll suppose that there are two possibilities. Uh, possibility theta one is that Alice likes solar best, then wind, then hydro, then nuclear power, and Bob and Cal have the 
rankings that I've indicated here. Cal, notice Cal doesn't care whether it's wind or solar. He likes either of those uh, just as well. So, th so this is one possibility, theta one. The other possibility is that Alice ranks nuclear power at the top, then solar, then hydro, then wind. Uh, and Bob has this ranking. Uh, to, to, to make matters simple, I've supposed that in both theta one and theta two, uh, Cal has the same has the same ranking. Okay, so I keep these rankings in mind. Uh, now, what? How? How would the mayor want to proceed um, uh, in in these circumstances? Well, uh, if theta one is the true state, if if these are the actual preferences, then there's then the mayor might argue, well, uh, wind is really the best option in this case, uh, solar is not so good because although uh, Alice, likes, uh, Alice likes solar uh, a lot, uh, Bob doesn't like solar at all. Uh, solar is at the bottom of Bob's ranking. And although Bob likes nuclear power, uh, Alice hates nuclear power. Uh, and hydro is not so good because both Alice and Bob uh, and Cal uh, prefer uh, wind uh, to hydro. So uh, wind is, is, is a reasonable choice if the preferences look like this. Uh, if the preferences look like theta two, then using the same sort of reasoning, uh, solar is going to be optimal. So let's suppose that the mayor wants to pick wind if theta one holds, and solar if theta two holds, but the problem is that the mayor doesn't know which of those two is the act, represents the actual preferences. So what can the mayor do? Well, he could simply ask Alice and Bob, um, it, is it theta one or is it theta two? But the problem is that if he, if he simply asks the straightforward question, he's not gonna get a straightforward answer because uh, Notice that Alice in both theta one and theta two prefers solar to wind. She ranks solar over wind here. She ranks solar over wind here. So she's going to want to make the mayor think that theta two is the actual state because that way she'll get solar, which she prefers to wind. So she's always going to say, theta two, and Bob is going to say just the opposite. Bob, Bob always prefers uh, wind to solar. He prefers wind to solar here, and he prefer prefers wind to solar here. So he's going to want to make the mayor think that theta one is the actual state. So uh, uh, Alice is going to say theta two, Bob is going to say theta one, and the poor mayor will have no idea what the actual state is. So simply asking citizens uh, is not going to work. Question is what will work? And I want to show you that, uh, that this mechanism here, this game works. So the idea here is that uh, Alice uh, in this game can either choose the top row or the bottom row as her strategy. And Bob in this game can either choose the left column or the right column as his strategy. And then the outcome is just the uh, energy source that the intersection of their choices gives. So if Alice chooses the top row, Bob chooses the left column, we have wind as the outcome. Uh, now I wanna show you that this uh, that this little mechanism actually solves the mayor's problem. Why? Well, let's imagine, first of all, that theta one are the actual preferences. So, so Alice, uh, Alice has this ranking here. Bob has this ranking here. I've left Cal out of the picture because there's no, there's no uncertainty 
uh, about Cal's preferences. He has the same preferences in, uh, in both theta one and theta two. So we can ignore him. Um, but uh, how is, how is uh, Alice going to behave in this mechanism if theta one are the actual preferences? Well, if she thinks that Bob is going to play the left column, then Alice is going to want to play the top row because notice that Alice prefers wind to nuclear power. So she's going to play the top row so that she gets wind rather than nuclear power. Furthermore, uh, Bob will want to play the left column because if he plays the left column um, and Alice plays the top row, he gets wind rather than hydro. And notice that Bob prefers wind to hydro. And if even if Alice played the bottom row, uh, Bob prefers nuclear to solar so in, in state theta one. Uh, so we see that Alice playing the top row and the, the top row and Bob playing the left column uh, is a Nash equilibrium of this mechanism in state theta in state theta one. And notice that in this Nash equilibrium, the outcome is wind, which is exactly what the mayor wants. So this mechanism solves the mayor's problem in state theta one. But actually, I've set this example up so that it's that there's complete symmetry between theta one and theta two and using exactly the same argument that I used for theta one, we can show, uh, you, you, you can show that Alice playing the, uh, the bottom row and Bob playing the right column will be the un unique Nash equilibrium of theta two. And in that case, solar is the outcome. Uh, which is exactly what the mayor wants. So we've shown that we can construct a mechanism which gives us the right outcome, uh, no matter what the true state is. Okay, so that, that's, that's a little example, um, but the big question is, can we do this sort of thing in general? Or uh, more accurately, when can we do it in general? I, I want to develop a theory which shows you uh, how we can determine whether a social goal, in this case, the right choice of energy can be achieved, and if so, uh, how it can be achieved. So that, that will be my, uh, that will be my general, uh, that will be my general mission. Um, Sergey, is, is everyone with me at, so far? Are there questions which need to be answered? No, not, not so far. Okay, so let, 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 let's look at this problem from a, from a general point of view. Uh, we'll suppose that there are, instead of just three people, we'll suppose that there are N people. Uh, and instead of just four possible outcomes, four kinds of energy, we'll suppose that there's some uh, uh, arbitrary number of outcomes. Uh, and this can, you can think of this at, as being applied to many different possibilities. One possibility would be that we're thinking of what public projects to undertake. Uh, another possibility is that we're deciding uh, how to out which goods to allocate to which people that's that's another kind of uh, important social problem. Uh, we can even think about this in a political context. We can think of the outcomes as the election of different candidates. So uh, which which political candidate should be elected yeah, is another question. Now uh, in in the example, there were just two possible, states of the world, two possible uh, sets of preferences that, that the uh, individuals could have. Now we're going to look at, again, at, a, at an arbitrary uh, 
uh, state space. Uh, and the, the, the idea of a state here is that once we know what the state actually is, we know uh, what the uh, individual's payoffs are. In fact, we might know other things too. We might know what the production technology is. But for today, I just want to concentrate on, uh, on payoffs. Uh, so uh, a payoff function or a utility function for individual I uh, depends on the, uh, so, the, so it, individual I's payoff will depend on uh, which outcome is selected and also on the, uh, on the state. So UI of A and theta is I's payoff if the outcome is A and the state is theta. Now in the, in the energy example, uh, the, uh, the, the, the mayor of society wanted to have uh, uh, wind power in state one and solar power in state two, uh, more generally, we can represent the social goals by what's called the social choice rule. Uh, if the state turns out to be theta, f of theta is going to be uh, some subset of A. So we're allowing for the possibility that there could be more than one option which is considered optimal, uh, which is considered best for society. Uh, f of theta could be uh, a single valued correspondence. That is, there might be a unique uh, optimum, but there, we're allowing for the, the more general possibility that there might be uh, multiple optima. So for state theta, you should interpret f of theta as being the optimal outcomes uh, in that state. Uh, now, in the energy example, in state theta one, uh, wind was optimal, and in state theta two, solar was optimal. Now, the, the mechanism design problem arises because the mechanism designer, uh, the mayor, or the planner, or the government, uh, uh, wants to choose the right outcome for the state that is actually uh, uh, that, that, that has actually been realized. Uh, and if, if the mechanism designer knows what that state is, then it's very easy to achieve an optimal outcome. Uh, the, uh, the mechanism designer can just say, well, I know that we're, we're in state theta, so I'm going to choose A because that's optimal in state theta. And no mechanism is needed in that case. But the problem, as in the energy example, is that uh, the mechanism designer may not know what theta is. And then, we, and then we have to use a mechanism. And so a mechanism uh, is just a game where each individual has a strategy set uh, and on the basis of the uh, strategies that the uh, N individuals choose, there, uh, there's an outcome. Uh, so G of S1 through Sn is the outcome uh, if uh, players play strategies S1 through Sn. Uh, and at, of course, what is a Nash equilibrium is going to depend on the state. Uh, so in state theta, S1 through Sn is a Nash equilibrium if no individual gains from deviating unilaterally. So, uh, so this, is, this is player I's payoff uh, in the Nash equilibrium in state theta. Uh, if player I 
deviates to SI prime, then this will be the outcome. Uh, if this is an equilibrium, his, his payoff cannot go up if he deviates. And so this is the same definition of Nash equilibrium we talked about last time. Uh, so given a mechanism, uh, we can look at the uh, Nash equilibrium outcomes in state theta. Of course, if we change preferences, we, we're going to change uh, what the Nash equilibrium outcomes are. Uh, let's, let's look at this set here. This is the set of all Nash equilibrium outcomes of mechanism G in state theta. This again is general enough so that it, it's allowing for the possibility of multiple Nash equilibria. Uh, here is the mechanism design problem, the implementation problem. We want to find a mechanism that implements our social goals F. And we will have accomplished that uh, if this equation holds for all theta. That is, regardless of what the state turns out to be, we want the set of Nash equilibrium outcomes to coincide with the optimal outcomes. And if, if, if we get this equation for all theta, we will say that the mechanism G implements F. So the big, the big question is, uh, when can we do that? When, when, when is a social choice rule uh, implementable? Uh, in the energy example, uh, we saw that the mayor's goals could be implemented, uh, but I will, I will show you in a little while that if we change those goals a little bit, um, then, um, uh, then they might not be implementable. So we, we want to be able to say when they are implementable, when they're not implementable, and how to find an implementing mechanism if, if implementation is possible. So it turns out that there's a condition called monotonicity of the social choice rule, uh, which is key to implementability. Uh, and a social choice rule is, uh, is monotonic uh, if the following holds. Let's, let's look at two states, theta and theta prime. And let's suppose that in state theta, outcome A is optimal. Now suppose it's the case that when we go from state theta to state theta prime, outcome A doesn't fall in anybody's uh, ranking of the alternatives. In other words, if individual I preferred A to B in state theta, then individual I also prefers A to B in state theta prime. So, so whatever alternatives A was above in state theta, A is still above those alternatives for individual I in state theta prime. Then if F is monotonic, uh, it should be the case that A is also optimal in state theta prime. Monotonicity, monotonicity is a little bit complicated to state, but it, it has this very simple interpretation. It, if A is an optimal outcome in a state, and now we just change the payoff functions, change the preferences so that uh, A doesn't fall 
relative to any other alternative in anybody's preferences, uh, then, um, then it should still be optimal. That, that's what monotonicity says. Uh, and in fact, if we go back to the energy example, we can see that the goal of choosing wind in state theta one and the goal of choosing solar in state theta two uh, constitutes a monotonic social choice rule. Why is that? Well, so, so we said that wind is optimal in state theta one. Uh, monotonicity says that if wind is, uh, is optimal in state one, it also has to be optimal in state two if it doesn't fall relative uh, to any other alternative for any individual. But notice that uh, wind was uh, above hydro and nuclear in Alice's ranking in state theta one. But wind has fallen to the bottom of Alice's ranking in state theta two. So uh, monotonicity uh, certainly does not require when to be optimal in state theta two, because in going from theta one to theta two, wind has fallen in Alice's ranking. Uh, and so monotonicity doesn't apply. And similarly, if we go from state theta two to theta one, solar, which was optimal in state theta two, falls in Bob's ranking. Solar was above hydro and nuclear in state theta two, but now solar is at the bottom uh, of Bob's ranking in state theta one. And so monotonicity does not tell us that just because solar was optimal in state theta two, it has to be optimal in state theta one. So in other words, the mayor's social choice rule is monotonic. It does not violate monotonicity. Uh, but let me give you an example of a non-monotonic, um, of a non-monotonic social choice rule. Suppose that uh, suppose that we're looking at state theta three and state theta four, and that the rankings look like this for Alice, Bob, and Cal. And let's suppose that we want to choose hydro in state theta three and nuclear in state theta four. Suppose, suppose that our social goal is given by uh, F hat. Well, the problem is that in going from, so we're assuming that hydro is optimal in state theta three, but notice that in going from these preferences to these preferences, Hydro doesn't fall in anybody's preference ordering. Uh, Alice prefers hydro to nuclear and wind in theta three. She also prefers hydro to nuclear and wind in theta four. Bob prefers hydro to solar in state theta three. He also prefers hydro to solar in state theta four. Uh, as usual, Cal's preferences don't change at all. So hydro uh, does not fall when we go from theta three to theta four. So that means that hy if hydro is optimal here, hydro should also be optimal here, but it's not. Uh, we said that nuclear is optimal here. So this, this social choice rule violates monotonicity. And as we're going to see, there's a, we'll see a general theorem on, on this point, because it violates monotonicity, it cannot be implemented. There is no mechanism that will implement uh, these social goals in, the, in this example. Okay, so there, there are going to be two theorems. 
Uh, the first one, uh, it will, will be very easy to prove. The first one shows that if a social choice rule is implementable, then it must be monotonic. So monotonicity is a necessary condition for implementability. Uh, we'll see in theorem two that monotonicity is almost a sufficient condition too. We're going to need an additional, uh, an additional requirement, but that additional requirement is really quite weak. So uh, uh, monotonicity is necessary and almost sufficient for implementability. Uh, and I'm going to prove this for you. Uh, Sergey. I just want to ch check uh, that everyone is with me before I launch into the proof. Any, any questions that we need to take up? Everyone is with you at this point. Okay, great. All right, how do we prove this? Well, we're assuming because F is implementable, that there's some mechanism, G, that implements it. Um, so let's look at some state theta and some outcome A, which is optimal in state theta. Because G implements F, we know that there must be a Nash equilibrium of the mechanism in state theta that gives rise to outcome A. That's what it means for, for G to implement F, that, that, that there has to be a Nash equilibrium which gives rise to the optimal outcome. Uh, so th this, is, this is the inequality uh, which expresses the fact that S1 through Sn is a Nash equilibrium. No individual wants to deviate from her Nash equilibrium strategy to any other strategy. Okay, so now um, we, we have to show that F is monotonic. So let's look at another state, theta prime, which satisfies the, uh, the premise of monotonicity. The premise of monotonicity is that if we go from state theta to state theta prime and optimal outcome A uh, is better than some other outcome B in state theta for individual I, then A must still be uh, above B uh, for individual i in state theta prime. So let, let's suppose that theta prime has this property that A doesn't fall uh, relative uh, to B in going from state theta to state theta prime. Well, what we, what we have to show, because is that A is optimal in state theta prime. That's, that's what monotonicity asserts. And, and we want to show that F, is monot that F is monotonic. So how do we do that? Well, suppose that so let's look at this Nash equilibrium we have in state theta. If individual i deviates to S i prime, then uh, th then we get this uh, outcome uh, g of S of S prime S minus i, but Think of this outcome as B. This inequality here is the same as this inequality. If, if you replace uh, 
this outcome, G of S, SI prime S minus I would be. So we know because we're assuming that this, this inequality implies this inequality. In other words, A is still better than B in state theta prime. But this inequality just says that, that uh, the, the Nash equilibrium in state theta is also a Nash equilibrium in state theta prime. So now we know that our original Nash equilibrium is also a Nash equilibrium in state theta prime, but that must mean that A is optimal in state theta prime because the definition of implementation says that any Nash equilibrium must be optimal. So if this is, if, if this is a Nash equilibrium in state theta prime, it must be the case that the outcome is optimal in that state. And so we've proved that an implementable social choice rule must be, must be monotonic. So a, a one slide proof. Um, let me pause there and see if there are any questions. No questions. No questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. No questions so far. Okay. So. Um, it's not quite the converse. Is not quite true. That that is, uh, it's not true that every monotonic social choice rule can be implemented. It's possible to to give examples. I'm not going to bother to do that here because they're, they're uh, somewhat complicated examples, but uh, there are monotonic social choice rules uh, that cannot be implemented, but uh, we can add an additional condition beyond monotonicity, which guarantees uh, that we do get it. And that additional condition is what is called uh, no veto power. So suppose that we have a state theta and an outcome A, which for all individuals J, except possibly for one individual I, outcome A is not just good, but it's the very best. So all individuals except for J rank A at the very top. Well, no veto power says that if, if we have an outcome which is uh, so, so popular that everybody except individual I thinks it's the best, well then, uh, individual I uh, cannot veto it. it. It must be considered optimal. Uh, so we're going to we're going to assume uh, no veto power, no veto power. And the reason why I say that it's weak is that if we have a reasonably large society, um, the chances that N minus one people agree that some outcome is not only good, but the very best uh, is pretty unlikely. Uh, in, a, in a diverse society, you don't typically get that much agreement. And so uh, uh, this premise of no veto power is, is very unlikely uh, to be satisfied. Uh, in most circumstances, which means that uh, in, those, in those circumstances, no veto power uh, is satisfied automatically. If you, if you could never satisfy the premise, then the, 
then the syllogism is, is automatically true. Okay, so now we come to the, uh, oh, and, and uh, by the way, the, the, in the energy example, uh, both uh, the goal F and the goal F prime uh, satisfy no veto power. Because if you remember in the, um, in the energy example, uh, 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 Alice, Bob, and Cal uh, uh, don't agree anyway uh, on on what is the top ranking. So again, no veto power is satisfied uh, automatically uh, in those examples. So now we come uh, to the uh, to the main theorem that I want to show you, uh, which is uh, which is this. Suppose that our goal, our social choice rule is monotonic and it satisfies no veto power. Um, and let's suppose that there are at least three people. It, it turns out, uh, and, and, and this, this is an interesting uh, point that I will come back to later, turns out that implementation with two people is harder uh, than uh, implementation with more than two. Uh, that might sound paradoxical because usually we think that adding more people makes life more difficult. This, this is an example where uh, the two person case is actually the hardest, and I'll, but I'll explain why it's the hardest uh, after I go through the uh, proof of the theorem. Um, so if there are at least three people, F is monotonic and it satisfies no veto power, we can implement it. And, and furthermore, the, um, unlike the, the Nash theorem and the von Neumann theorem that we saw in the first lecture, the proof of this theorem will be constructive. That is, we will actually create a mechanism uh, that implements the social choice rule in question. Okay, uh, now the argument um, will first consist of my constructing the mechanism. So I'm first going to construct a mechanism for you. It's a, it's, the, the mechanism itself is a little bit complicated. Uh, so I'm not saying that we would ever actually want to use this mechanism in practice. It's really just showing you that there exists a mechanism. And then once we know that there exists mechanism, we can uh, work hard to simplify it so that it could be used in practice. Um, so the first, when we're constructing a mechanism, the first thing we have to do is to uh, decide what the strategy spaces are for the different uh, players. So, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to make the strategy space for player I, the cross product of the state space and the outcome space and the natural numbers. Uh, in other words, uh, when, it, when player I uh, chooses a strategy, she's going to make an announcement about the state. We'll call that uh, uh, theta i. She's going to propose an alternative, uh, a i, and she is going to uh, name a number, a natural number, uh, uh, a, a non, a non-negative integer. Uh, now, you may be wondering, uh, uh, what are these integers doing here? Uh, as you'll see, the integers actually uh, don't play any role in equilibrium. They're, they're, they're a way to, to break ties 
if out of equilibrium. So don't, don't worry about the integers for now. So as I just said, an individual is making an announcement about the state. By the way, it, uh, it doesn't have to be a true announcement. Uh, the, the individual is not compelled to announce the true state. The individual can announce any state that he wants. Uh, he's, also, he's proposing an outcome and he's proposing a, uh, an integer. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is to, to say what the outcome is if everybody is playing the same strategy. So suppose everybody is announcing state theta, everyone is proposing outcome A, and that outcome is optimal in state theta. Remember, we're, 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 we're fixing F, uh, the, the social choice rule, and we're trying to construct a mechanism which implements F. Uh, well, a natural thing to do, if everybody is playing the same strategy, if everyone is announcing theta A and A is optimal given the announced state, is just to make the outcome the proposed the proposal that everyone's making, A. So we'll do that. So that, that's if we have complete unanimity in strategies. Suppose that, suppose that one player is deviated. So everybody everybody except individual I is playing strategy theta A uh, and, and, and furthermore, A, um, A is optimal given the state that is being announced, but uh, Individual J, uh, sorry, individual I is doing something else. So I is deviating from this, from this unanimity. Uh, well, then the outcome is going to depend on, uh, on what outcome that individual I is proposing. So, so individual I is proposing outcome AI. Suppose that AI, according to the state that the others are naming, is worse than the outcome that the others are proposing. The others are proposing A. Individual I is proposing AI. Suppose AI is actually worse for, uh, for I, I keep losing my arrow. Where is my arrow? Oh, there it is. Uh, suppose that A is worse for I uh, according to the state that the others are proposing, then the, the outcome that the others are proposing, which is A. Well, in that case, we'll say that, that I can get the outcome that he's proposing because he's not being too greedy. Gre gre greediness means proposing an outcome for I, which is better than the outcome that the others are proposing. Uh, if, if, I do, if, if I does that, if this inequality is satisfied, if, if AI is better than me, for individual I, then I is not allowed to get that. That's too greedy. Uh, but he can get AI uh, if he's not being if he's not being greedy. If AI is worse than A, so so that's that's how we'll 
define the mechanism uh, in the case where uh, there's near unanimity, n minus one players are doing one thing and player i uh, is, is doing something else. Uh, and interestingly, we only have to consider one additional case. Uh, the third case, case C, covers everything else. Uh, and in this third case, that's where we use the uh, integers, the which will be a tiebreaker. In, in that case, uh, the outcome is the, uh, yeah, is the outcome being proposed by the individual uh, who is uh, who is announcing the highest integer? So the integers are being used to determine which player uh, gets his uh, his favorite outcome. Uh, now, of course, there could be a tie here. Uh, if there's a tie here, we can uh, break the break the tie in, in some arbitrary way. That, that actually doesn't matter. Uh, so so these, these three cases, A, B, and C, uh, cover all possibilities. Uh, and so we've now fully constructed our mechanism. And the only thing left to do is to check that this mechanism uh, actually uh, implements our social choice rule F. Uh, are, there any, are there any questions about the construction of the mechanism, the, 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 the rules of the mechanism? People are a little bit confused about the notation. Can you please clarify what is A, I, U, I, just the basics? Sure. Okay, so let, let's, let's go back. Um, to this slide here. Um, Well, actually, let's go back to uh, to this. So each each uh, each player is announcing three things: a state theta i, an alternative a i, and an integer m i. Uh, if if outcome A is is implemented, if outcome A is implemented, individual and and state theta is the actual state, player I's payoff is ui of a and theta. Now, the mechanism designer doesn't know what the state is. So the mechanism designer doesn't actually know what uh, player i's payoff really is, but he does know what the payoff would be if the state really were theta. The payoff would be ui of the outcome, which is chosen, a, and the state theta. I hope that helps resolve the questions. Any, any, any follow-up? No follow-ups on this one. I hope so as well. Hey, this, this is a fundamental question. So if, if people, don't don't understand the answer that they're not going to understand the mechanism. <laughs> uh, so I hope I hope they're following me. I think most people do. It's just okay. several 
Stund. Okay. Okay, so we have, so we've now fully constructed the mechanism and uh, now I have to show you that the mechanism um, actually works, that it implements F. <laughs> so the first, uh, the first uh, part of that demonstration is this claim. <clears throat> Suppose that in state theta, outcome A is optimal. Well, then I want to claim that if everybody announces the true state theta and this optimal outcome A and integer one, actually uh, for, for this part, people could be announcing different integers, that would be fine because the integers aren't going to play any role here. But let's suppose they announced integer one. Uh, well, then um, this will be a Nash equilibrium, uh, which, is, which is good because uh, the outcome will be A and by assumption, A is optimal in that state. So in other words, if, if we can establish claim one, uh, we will have shown that any optimal outcome corresponds to a Nash equilibrium of the mechanism, which is part of, which is part of what we have to show. We have to show that every, Every, every time there's an optimal outcome, there is a Nash equilibrium, which delivers that outcome. Uh, we also have to show that every Nash equilibrium is, out, is optimal, but that's, that's, that will come later. That's the, second, that's the second part of the proof. First, we have to show that for every optimal outcome, there is a Nash equilibrium uh, that delivers it. And that's what this claim uh, is, is saying. So, so let's prove the claim. Well, if we go back to case A of construction, uh, if everybody is playing the same strategy, theta A, and A is optimal, given the state that they are announcing, theta, then the outcome, uh, then the outcome will indeed be the, uh, the alternative that, that they are announcing, which is, which is A. So uh, so part two of this claim is, is true by construction. Um, now, the remaining, the remaining argument is that we have to show that this is actually a Nash equilibrium. It, if people play these strategies, then we will get the right outcome. We will get A. But how do we know that they have the incentive uh, to play these strategies? How do we know uh, that, this is, that these strategies form a Nash equilibrium? Well, that's where we use um, part B of the construction. Suppose, suppose um, one player, player I, deviated from the Nash equilibrium and proposed some other outcome AI. So he didn't. He didn't propose A, he proposed AI instead. Uh, well, remember we can, case B was, was 
constructed in such a way that if you deviate, you can't get anything better than A. Uh, assuming that theta is the true state. So that means that a deviation can't possibly pay. So that means that this is a Nash equilibrium. After all, unilateral deviations by players from the Nash equilibrium uh, cannot be profitable. So, uh, so claim one is, um, is proved. So the remaining part of the proof is to show that if we have a Nash equilibrium resulting in outcome A, then A must be optimal. So we've just shown that all optimal A are Nash equilibrium outcomes. We have to show the converse, which is that all Nash equilibrium outcomes are optimal. And if we do that, then we will have shown that the two sets, the optimal set and the Nash equilibrium set are the same. Uh, before I get on to the rest of the proof, any, any questions about the proof of claim one? No, nothing that I see. Okay. All right, so let's suppose that we're in an equilibrium where everybody is playing the same strategy. They're all announcing theta. They're all announcing A. And A is optimal for theta. However, theta is not actually the true state. Suppose that the true state is theta prime. And, and suppose that uh, these strategies uh, form a Nash equilibrium in the true state. Nothing, nothing I've said rules out this possibility that because players are not required to announce the true state. They can announce any state they want. So suppose they announce uh, state theta, they all announce state theta, but the true state is, is state theta prime. Um, we have to show that despite the fact that they're announcing a false state, that the outcome is actually optimal with respect to the true state. That, that's our claim. Uh, and this is going to require, this is where we use monotonicity. Remember, we already saw that monotonicity is a necessary condition. Uh, here, here is where we show that uh, uh, it's an important part of sufficiency. All right. so. Suppose everybody is playing this strategy, theta A. They're announcing state theta. They're announcing outcome A. Uh, then we know, oh, and, and, and A is optimal with respect to the false state theta. Uh, then we know that the outcome is A. That, that's part A of the construction. Uh, now, let's look at some outcome B, which for uh, which for individual I in state theta is worse than the than outcome A. So this inequality is satisfied. Well, I remember we said that in part B, 
of the construction, if you deviate and you propose a different outcome, you can get that outcome uh, as long as it gives you a lower utility, a lower payoff, according to the state that the others are proposing. Well, that's true of this outcome B. It's, it's worse than A according to state theta, which is what everyone else is proposing. So if individual I deviates and proposes outcome B, he will get outcome B. That will be the outcome of the mechanism. He's not being greedy. He will get B. But that means that uh, if B really were better than A for individual I, according to the true preferences, theta prime, he could have deviated and gotten B. Now we're assuming that that these strategies are a Nash equilibrium in state theta prime. So that means that it cannot be the case that I can deviate and get a better outcome B. So this inequality is impossible because if this inequality held, then I could deviate and get B and that would violate the assumption that this is a Nash equilibrium. So that tells us that, um, that this inequality implies this inequality. If A is better than B, according to the preferences in the false state for individual I, A must be better than B according to I's true preferences, the, the true state theta prime. But look what we have now. We have the premise for monotonicity. Monotonicity says that if in going from state theta to state theta prime, A does not fall vis a B, B. That is, if A was above B before, it's still above B. That's, that's the premise of monotonicity. Monotonicity says that we can conclude that because A was optimal in the full state theta, it must also be optimal in the true state theta prime. And so even though we have a Nash equilibrium where people are announcing full states, it's still the outcome is still going to be optimal with respect to the true state, the true preferences. And, and that establishes claim two. Uh, so, so where are we? we? We've shown that if we have unanimous, if we have a, a Nash equilibrium with uh, unanimous truthful announcements, that is people are announcing the true state, that's a Nash equilibrium, which is, and it's optimal. And we've also shown that if we have uh, unanimous announcements of a false state, and that's a Nash equilibrium, it's still optimal, that, that, that's, that's claim two. So now we have to cover cases where players are not unanimous. So far, we've looked only at Nash equilibria where everybody is doing the same thing. So let's look at claim three where uh, everybody with player I is announcing one thing, they're announcing theta A, but I is, is, is announcing something else. Now, what I claim 
is that if this is a Nash equilibrium, and suppose that the true, that the true state is theta prime, that is it, it may not bear any relationship to what people are announcing, that nevertheless, uh, the outcome, the Nash equilibrium outcome is optimal with respect to the true preferences. That's, that's claim three. So if we have a non-unanimous Nash equilibrium, the outcome must be optimal with respect to the true state, uh, theta prime. Okay, why is that the case? Well, let's, let's look at all of these players, J not equal to I. They're, they're all doing the same thing. I is doing something else. But notice that all of these players, J, who are doing the same thing, any one of them could deviate and do some third thing. So there'll be, now there'll be three groups of players. There'll be the players announcing theta A. There'll be, there's individual I who's do, doing something else. And there will be the deviating J who is, who is doing some third thing. Well, that puts us into KC. Remember in KC where you have a, uh, a non-unanimous, a non-unanimous, uh, uh, configuration of strategies. Uh, the player who announces the highest integer gets his favorite outcome. So any of these players, J, by deviating from theta A, could, if he wanted to, get his favorite outcome. Uh, AJ prime. The fact that he didn't deviate, the fact that this is a Nash equilibrium, tells us that he must already have been getting his favorite outcome. If he didn't deviate, and he could have deviated and get his favorite outcome, then he, he must already be getting his favorite outcome in the Nash equilibrium. In other words, n minus one players are getting their favorite outcome in this Nash equilibrium. But here's where we apply no veto power. If n minus one players are getting their favorite outcome, then the last player, player I, cannot veto uh, the others. And so we can, we can conclude that uh, we can conclude that the outcome of this Nash equilibrium is optimal with respect to the true state theta prime. Okay, so there's just one more case to go. We, we've looked at cases where we have unanimous true announcements, unanimous false announcements, uh, almost unanimous announcements. Uh, that is where uh, N minus one players are doing the same thing and the last player is doing something else. Uh, claim four, uh, looks at all other possible cases. Suppose we have a Nash equilibrium where we have neither unanimity nor near unanimity. Well, in that case, every player can deviate and get his favorite alternative according to the KC construction. Uh, and so uh, if this is going to be a Nash equilibrium, 
every player must already be getting his favorite alternative without deviating. And so again, by no veto power, uh, we know that the outcome from this Nash equilibrium must be optimal. And, um, and, that's, and that's it, we, we, we finished the proof. We, we've shown that every uh, optimal outcome can be a Nash equilibrium. And we've shown that every Nash equilibrium must be optimal in every state. It's constructive proof. Now, admittedly, this is not a game that you would want to play in real life. It's a, too complicated, but I said that uh, it's, it's valuable nevertheless, because A, it tells us when an implementing mechanism can be found. Uh, and second, uh, once we have this mechanism, we can, we can simplify it so that it actually uh, could be played in practice. And in fact, uh, mechanisms simpler than this, but based on the same principles uh, are used uh, quite a lot uh, in cases where the mechanism designer doesn't know what the state is. Uh, let me pause once again to see whether there are any questions about the about the proof. There are several questions. Uh, uh, several people are confused about the same question, which is not really about the proof. It's more fundamental. They are uh, asking, uh, what do we mean by optimality here? Uh, whose utilities are maximized? And what are the alternatives? Okay, so the, 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 I guess the most fundamental part of that are what are the alternatives? Let's imagine we're in a, in a situation like the mayor was in the energy example. In that case, the alternatives were solar, nuclear, et cetera. There were four alternatives. And the may and by optimality, we just meant that the, uh, that the town wanted to adopt wind if it turned out that people's preferences were theta one and wanted to ad adopt solar if preferences were theta two. So you can think of F here as representing the goals of the town or the goals of the society. If we knew what theta was, we would know which outcome to adopt, solar or wind or something else. But we don't know what theta is. I mean, individuals know their own preferences, but they don't, but the, the mayor, or the town leadership doesn't know what theta is. So we play, we play a, uh, a mechanism, G, in the hope that the net, when, when players reach a Nash equilibrium, that equilibrium will be optimal with respect to the goals that the society has set, represented by F. So in theorems one and two, I have just done at a general level what we did at the example level uh, when we talked about an energy choice. Uh, the, the idea here is to show that the, that the same principles apply uh, regardless of the application. You can, you, can, you can apply mechanism design to choosing energy for a town, you can apply mechanism design to uh, choosing uh, political candidates for office. You can, you, you can use mechanism to design to uh, decide uh, whether the, 
whether a society should uh, uh, devise a particular healthcare scheme or some other that imagine there are many different possible ways we could run our healthcare. How, do, how are we going to choose which one to actually adopt? Well, that will depend on the preferences of the citizens, but we don't know those preferences. And so we play this mechanism uh, in order to uh, get at the right healthcare scheme for the, uh, for the citizens' preferences, even though we don't know what those preferences are in advance. I hope that helps to answer that, those fundamental uh, uh, questions that people had. No more questions. Okay, so I, I, I wanted to say uh, something. I, I, I mentioned that uh, mechanism design is actually harder for two players than it is for more than two. Uh, which, which sounds strange because usually you think that with more people, things become more complicated. Uh, but uh, the, the point comes back to um, this construction here in case B. In case B, we had all but one player doing one thing, and there was one player who was deviating. And we had to decide what the outcome would be when that player deviated. Now here is where we are using the fact that there are at least three players. Because if there were only two players and they were doing different things, you wouldn't be able to tell whether one was doing the Nash equilibrium thing and two was deviating, or two was doing the Nash equilibrium thing and one was deviating. So the advantage of having three or more players is that you can identify who the deviator is and take appropriate action. Uh, I mean, th 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 this, is, this is a basic principle uh, in, uh, in, in law enforcement. If, uh, if, if, if different people are, uh, if, if everybody is doing something different, it's very difficult to know uh, who to punish. But if, if uh, all but one person is doing the same thing and, and, the, and the odd man out is doing something else, that, that is the player who has to be punished. The, that's the individual who has to be punished. So uh, that's why mechanism design is harder for two players than for more than two. You can't, it's harder to identify uh, deviators. And uh, that really uh, wraps up what I wanted to say today. Uh, if, if there are uh, questions uh, that have not been answered, uh, Sergey will, will make a record of those and I will uh, either answer them offline or uh, at the beginning of the next lecture. The lecture on Friday uh, is about uh, auctions. Uh, you, you all know about auctions. Maybe you've participated in them in person or online. We're, we're going to see what game theory can do to help us understand how auctions work. Any, uh, so I think we're done for today. Let me uh, stop sharing and uh, see you on Friday, or at least many of you.
Thank you very much. Yeah, it was nice talk. Yeah. Good. See you Friday.